Thank you so much, Ian. And thank you, Kelly. Yeah. All right. Jesus is good. Man. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness, your love, and your mercy, and your grace. Father, thank you for the, the joy in your presence that comes from the victory of the, ooh, the gospel, the victory of Jesus. Whoa, the love of the Father, the power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for your resurrection power, the resurrection power of God that is uh, here today, present here today, because you're here. Thank you that where you are, miracles happen. Life happens. Dead things come to life where Jesus of Nazareth is. Thank you for your promise that wherever we are gathered together, there you are in the midst of us. And there's no separation from between us and you because of what you've done. Ascending your, your Holy Spirit who uh, abides in us and lives in us and is powerful to keep us. It makes us holy and spotless and without blemish. Your blood and your spirit, your blood and your spirit. Thank you, Father. Thank you for your glory that covers the earth. And may the knowledge of it cover the earth like the waters cover the sea. As we are uh, awakened in this generation to who we are as sons and daughters of the King. So God, we just, we, we're filled and dripping with gratitude because of what you've done. Because you love us so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Yes. One of my, my, I think my top, my top two prayers are thank you, Lord, and help, Lord, you know. And, whoo, they're the top two. <laughs> oh, my gosh. But he's so good, and he loves us so much. Is there anybody here, that, this is their first time hearing me share here? Is somebody that's never heard me before? A couple people? Very good. All right. So my name is Brian Britton, and I uh, pastored for years in Williamsburg, Virginia, and near Richmond, Virginia as well, and in Texas a couple years, uh, Central Texas, and but my wife, uh, Valerie, and I, we've been blessed to serve the Lord for you know, about 20 years together. And uh, I started in ministry when I was 30 years old, and I'll be 50 next weekend. So uh, God has been so faithful, so faithful over the years. I've been able to preach the gospel in over 30 nations, and I never left Virginia hardly until I was 30 years old. <laughs> you know, I was born down in Portsmouth, Virginia, and then I, I went to college at Bridgewater College here in the Shenandoah Valley, down by Harrisonburg, and uh, played football there, coached football there after I graduated, and all I wanted to be was a football coach, and I got to coach for six years at Bridgewater and Hamden and Sydney and Hargrave Military Academy and Colgate University, and that's all I wanted to do, and then God called me to preach the gospel, you know, and, uh, and it's always good to be up here in this place, and I, I was blessed to we took over this church in Williamsburg, Virginia, my wife and I, and uh, my wife's from Russia. We met in seminary. She just left today on a mission trip, be play, praying for her. She went to over there to Eastern Europe to help with uh, refugees who are fleeing the war in Ukraine. She works for a ministry that works with orphans in Ukraine and because uh, she speaks the language, and she's kind of like the interpreter and translator for them. But uh, they just left today. They're on their way to Dulles right now to go. They're going to be in Romania and Slovakia and in Ukraine a little bit too. So be praying for her. It's weird, like she's Russian, you know. But uh, when, when we got married, the Lord told us, uh, you know, yes, you love your nations, but we're kingdom, you're kingdom people. Above all else, we're kingdom people. Like I'm a, I'm a citizen of the United States and I love America. My family's been in Virginia for 400 years. But I, I am, I'm of the kingdom of God, you know, uh, first and foremost. And my wife is too, and that's why, you know, when she got the call, she's like, I'm going, I'm going, but uh, I love her radical obedience, you know, and uh, we've always been involved with missions, even when I was, we were pastoring local church, and we pastored for 15 years, yeah, uh, we were always going on mission, and uh, it's something I, I've always, it's always been in me, I believe we take the gospel to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, 
the ends of the earth, all at the same time, just like the church did in the book of Acts. And uh, we've uh, been blessed to pastor churches, and now we pastor pastors and missionaries around the world. We're part of Iris Global Ministries Hyris, with uh, Heidi and Roland Baker. And, uh, and that, with our own ministry organization, keeps us really busy. And, and we are the blessed, I believe we have the best life as Christians, all of us, to represent Jesus Christ. And I'm, uh, we sang these worship songs today. They were getting up in my spirit, like these songs that we were singing. And I, I love to worship. Do you all love to worship? I, uh, Lauren Cunningham, who's the founder of YWAM, it's a great missions organization. He said the purpose of the church is worship which I thought he would say it's missions or evangelism. But he said the purpose of the church is worship because the reason we have missions, the reason we have evangelism is so they'll all worship him. That's the whole point. The whole point is get everyone's eyes locked on him like we were talking about. That's, what it's, that's the whole purpose of everything, to, to worship him, to fall in love with him, to be a people of the one thing, a people of the presence. Uh, I love when we said when I look, when I lock eyes with you, I don't know if you've ever locked eyes with him before, but it, it, it'll change you. It'll mess you up. You know, we're, we're not, uh, we sing that, that older song, you know, I'm not going to sing about you or talk about you like you're not in the room. You know, he's here, man. Like uh, in, uh, in, in worship, you know, a, a lot of times I see a whole lot more with my eyes closed. You know, I've been here a few times, so I'm just going to talk to you all like family. Uh, I'm going to just share some things God's been sharing with me, and uh, like I would to our own people. And, uh, but, but when you lock eyes with him, you know, the Song of Solomon says that, that it says, I love the Passion Translation, and it, and it reads that he's captured by our gaze because he loves us so much. That just made me uncomfortable the first time I, I read that. I was like, what? How can he love me so much? You know, because... I knew what I'd be without, without him, you know, but by the grace of God, uh, none of us can approach him. But that, that's how he feels for us. And we sang that he's our obsession. Is he your obsession? Or are you just singing words, man? Because I don't have time for foolishness anymore. I'm getting ready to be 50 years old. I don't have time for foolishness. You know, tomorrow's not promised. I don't have time for it. Is he your obsession? Well, I don't got time to just to sing songs about some guy who died 2,000 years ago. I'm, I'm singing to the living Jesus. Come on. Woo. And this is a, I can, I can fix every problem in your life with one thing. And that's not arrogant. That's the truth. And that's a red, hot, burning, passionate love affair with Jesus of Nazareth to where he's your number one thought. He's, he's everything. And in the morning, I can't wait to go be with him. And I can't wait to get in the secret place I can't wait, you know, when, when I'm home, I'm, I'm traveling, I, I'm really happy. My wife goes to work, and I've got the house to myself, and I can get in the secret place. Oh, man, it's so good. And I can't wait to get there and what he's going to show me on a given day, what he's going to speak to me. I hope you, you love him like that because we are a people of the one thing, a people of the presence. Yes? You were made to live in the presence. Yeah, come on, I like it when you talk back to me, that's good. Yes, we we're made to, li we're people of the presence. The word presence in the original language, it, it means the people of the face, face to face. People that live face to face with him. I love uh, our, our buddy Jason Lee Jones, who's going to be here for y'all's conference I saw. He sings a song called Face to Face. It's powerful. I love it. I hope y'all appreciate Jason Lee Jones, man. Like, you know, that guy's like, He's like Jesus culture in Brazil. Like, he's, he's the man. Like, Jason, they love him so much there because he's poured out his life there. You know, he's an incredible brother. I have so much that Jason Lee Jones love him. But um, we were singing, like, come in like a fire, come in like the flood. I don't care what it looks like because I'm so in love. I heard y'all talking up by the door when I was sitting out there eavesdropping on y'all before the service. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I heard you talking about, you know, fire tunnels and, la and the joy of the Lord and, and, and people getting knocked into people's coffee and, 
like all kinds of stuff. And you don't care what it looks like. I don't care because I'm so in love with him. And, you know, when you're in love, you don't care about a lot of stuff that doesn't mean anything. And I believe God's getting us back to the main things, you know, back to the basics. So as a football coach, stuff's not going good. You get back to the basics. And the truth is that we were never supposed to leave the basics. You're never supposed to leave the gospel. We don't need to preach all kinds of other stuff. There's no pressure to come up with some kind of extravagant stuff that nobody's ever heard before. Because the, the gospel is the power of God. That's what we're talking about. We're preaching Jesus Christ. Come on, somebody. Hey. <laughs> we were singing, all I see is you. Because there's a lot of people, they get caught up by what they're seeing right now. With all the stuff on the news and everything. Like, We need to be reading the good news. Get, get that in you so much that the other stuff doesn't affect you. That I look at that through the good news, through the, through the lens of what Jesus has done. Man, it feels like it's coming out like a fire hose today, so just get ready to take it. One time I was in the presence of God, and I felt like I was going to die. Like I was like, oh, I can't take no more. And he's just like, take it, take it. I felt like, uh. Heidi Baker shared uh, something one time and about how she felt like she was under the water, you know, like Peter was when he fell. And he stepped out of the boat, and he began to walk, and then he fell, and he's under the water. And maybe you've seen that picture where, like, Jesus is kind of looking down, and you're in the water, and he's there, and he wants to pull you up. And, and she said that she felt like he was just holding her under, you know, just like, you have to die. You know, you, you've got to die to be able to receive this, what I want to give to you. So that's my message today. Like, you have to die. I hope you're already dead. <laughs> I hope you're already dead. Because my Bible says, my Bible says that we have been crucified with Christ, you know, co-crucified. We have that word in English. I'm down in Brazil a lot, and they don't have that word co-crucified. They don't have co like we do. They say we've been crucified with Christ. It's the same thing. But they don't have that word co-crucified. We've been co-crucified with Christ, and we are dead to this world, crucified to this world, it says. You know, and if, and if you're not dead, it, it opens up. A lot of problems in the church because a lot of things start happening to you that's supposed to be dead instead of now to live as Christ. It's no longer I who live. Christ lives in me. You know, but if it's not that, if it's still you reigning in you, you know, if people don't treat you right, you get offended, you get hurt, you get bitter, and it's all me, 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 me. It's supposed to be dead, you know, and that's a big problem. And that's why I'm not the best Christian counselor in the world. Because <laughs> I'm just like, have you read the book? Like, stop it. Remember that old skit with Bob Newhart? He's like a psychiatrist. Some of y'all are too young to remember that. But this person came into his office, and they would have a problem, and he would just say, stop it. And she's like, I'm having all these. He's just like, stop it. But I want to tell you this. I'll get in the side. Like, believe the book. Believe it. Get it in you. Believe it. All I see is you. That's what we say. When all you see is him, everything else melts like wax in the presence of God. Everything else pales in comparison to his beauty, his majesty. And we should not be so easily distracted, beautiful people. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 22, it speaks to this, all I see is you. It says, if the eye is good, if the eye is single, it says in some translations, then the whole body will be filled with light. You know, if the eye is single. But if the eye is not single, there's a bunch of other stuff that gets in there. And you're, you can't be full of light because you've got other stuff that you're full of that, that, are, that are keeping you from being full of light. Like if I, I take this bottle of water, and if I put a rock in it, no matter how much water's in that thing, it's still not full of water. It's got other stuff in it. And, and he wants to get that out of us. Ooh, come on. And the way you keep a broken vessel full is you keep it under the tap. That's how it stays full, because I'm under the tap 24-7, living under the tap. Otherwise, I can't stay full. I don't know about you, 
but I've got to live in that place because if I get out of that place, I get other stuff in me. You know, stuff gets on you. So I live in that place. You don't have to leave that place. You don't have to take off the armor of God. Put it on every day. Just put it on. Leave it on. Because the Bible says in him we live and move and have our being all the time. This is where we are. Why would I choose to put that off at night especially? Like, leave it. You need it at night. Are you all tracking with me? Come on. Shakaraba. This is just a flow of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. The more we seek him, the more we find him. That's true. The Bible says he rewards those who diligently seek him. So he loves you and me the same. But there's rewards. And it's a competition for me. <laughs> no, we're like, no. No, but I'm going after it. Like, I want it. I don't know if you want it. But I want I want the reward. And he rewards us with more of himself. More of his more of his love. More of his hope, joy goodness, grace, mercy, all the things that he is, holiness, righteousness. That's what we get more of when we seek after him. You know, he's not going to, if you're coming to him for bread, he's not going to give you a rock. No, like he's going to give you more of himself. In Ephesians, it tells us that all the spiritual blessings in heaven we have in Christ. That's what he's going to give you. It's called the kingdom of God. The kingdom is near. The kingdom is at hand. Luke, it says the kingdom is within. What is the kingdom? It's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. In righteousness, holiness, I'll talk about that in a moment, but how about peace and joy? Two-thirds of the kingdom of God that we have in the Holy Spirit are things you feel and things you experience. And I've heard people in the church say, it's not about feeling. It's not about experience. It's about faith. Yeah, it's about faith. Absolutely. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. But if you're in the kingdom of God, you're feeling stuff. And you should be feeling peace. You feel the peace of God. It's a tangible. It's like, oh, you know, it's, it's, it's opposite of anxiety and fear. And we can have this. Because of the Holy Spirit that reigns in us. But we have to yield to him and let him be the king. It's the spirit of the king. And joy. You feel joy. Joy feels good. Come on. And the world does not need a grumpy church. You know. It needs a joy-filled church. You know. I, I go to a lot of crazy places in the world. I've been, just the past year, I've been in Pakistan and Iraq, and I've been in Sudan and sat with people in prisons where they wear chains 24-7. And I've seen people to have joy, the joy of the Lord, in these places, in, in uh, war zones, okay? Uh, <laughs> uh, even now, with what's going on in Ukraine, the believers are still believers. The believers act different. David Hogan says there's believers and make-believers. You know, so what camp do you fall in? You can be filled with joy. That's how I believe the glory of the Lord is going to be revealed in this dark mess. Is when it doesn't make any sense for you to be filled with joy. But you got joy in your heart. Why do we have joy in our heart? Because Jesus is with us. Because he's with us. He's in us. Christ in you, the hope of glory. I have joy because I have Jesus. But I've got a bad diagnosis, but I have Jesus with me. Jason Lee Jones can tell you all about that. Or, or uh, I'm, I'm going through this situation. I, I lost my job. Or I, if, you're, if you live long enough, you're going to experience all this stuff. You know, he never told us that everything's going to be great when you give your life to me. He said, I'm going to be with you. Come on, but that's awesome. That's good that he's going to be with me. No matter what happens, whether uh, I lose my, what if I become a martyr? I know people who become martyrs, you know. I'll never forget one time I was in Mozambique and Heidi called us up to pray for the pastors in Mozambique and China who were there who had been in prison for their faith, who had been tortured 
for their faith. You know, but I'm telling you, our joy is not dependent upon our circumstances. It's on the abiding presence of the living God. And that's crazy and foolishness to the world. But for those of us who know him, who are we've locked eyes with him, it's not foolishness. Come on, and we're going to need this stuff. When I first took over our church in Williamsburg years ago, it was a Pentecostal holiness church, and God began to speak to us a lot about revival. And uh, there was one particular elder in the church, and everyone was like, you're going to have problems with this guy because he is not into some of the stuff you're talking about. I'm like, he's not into a move of God? Like revival? Then why is he in the church? And I'm thinking in my head, and they're like, he's very traditional, and he's all about the word. I'm like, I'm all about the word. I love the word. Every sentence that comes out of my mouth is pretty much from the scripture because I live in the word. You know, I don't have to give people the address every time. It's still the power, full word of God. The original language didn't have chapter and verse. Just so you know, but this guy, they're like, you're going to have a problem with this guy. And I, so I decided I was going to take him to a meeting where he could just get wrecked. Where if I brought him there, that he would have a chance to, for the Holy Spirit to come upon him and just mess up his life. So uh, I took him to see this lady named Winnie Banoff, who's like Georgian Banoff's wife. Y'all know Georgian, right? So, okay, it was, it was uh, Winnie. And Winnie's wild, man. She's really wild. Like, but if you listen to what she say, it's all word, all the word of God. She loves the word of God. And uh, so I knew. So I just told him, I'm like, just listen to her. Don't, it doesn't matter how it's presented. Like, just listen to what she says. And he did. And by the end of the night, we were on the floor together. You know, and, he was, and he's like, and he looked at me with joy on his face. And he's like, we're going to need this stuff. I'm like, yes, we're going to need this stuff. And he became our biggest supporter all the years we were there. He was our biggest supporter and blessing to us. And we're going to need this stuff. The more we find him, the more we love him. That's the truth. The more you eat, the more you drink, the more you want of him. You know, I can tell who's spending a lot of time in the presence because they're the hungriest. They're the thirstiest. Uh, the more in the kingdom, the more you eat and drink, the hungrier and thirstier you get. The, it's different than the world where you get full. Here, the more you have, the more you have to get. You just need more. You want more. You can't have enough of him. So I can tell by what you're talking about is when you're feeding on him, you don't talk about yourself so much more. You talk about him a lot because you're in love with him, not yourself so much. It always gets quiet when I say that because people are thinking, what do I talk about? <laughs> no. We sang today, I'm no longer a slave to fear. Because perfect love cast out fear, right? And fear is antichrist. It's the opposite of Jesus. Antichrist stuff needs to be out of the church. Come on, it needs to be out of you. And he can, he can help with that. He does it. You just ask him moment by moment. You take your thoughts captive to obedience obedience in Christ. When you have fearful thoughts, crazy thoughts, that's not who you are. And you take those thoughts captive to obedience in Christ. And you say, that's not me. This is who I am. I'm a daughter of the king. I'm a son of the king. You know, whoa, come on. I, and Jesus walked in such intimacy with God. I'm on this Holy Spirit ramble. Y'all are looking at me like, what's coming next? You know, but Jesus walked in in such intimacy with God that his authority was never in question because his communion was constant. He didn't need to have, you know, emergency prayer meetings about stuff because he was living connected in communion, real communion, connected in union with, with the Father all the time. Sure, we can live like that too. But he wants to clear, I believe he wants to clear out a bunch of junk in the church. He's getting us ready getting us ready now for some good stuff. Ooh, come on. But he's got to, he wants he's to purify us. The Lord's been speaking to me about the crucified bride. That doesn't sound fun, but, but wait. I mentioned earlier about how we were crucified in this world. You know? And we are. 
you know, now we live to live as Christ. And that's why you're, the Bible says he's coming back for a pure and spotless bride without blemish. Yeah. And it's because we were crucified with him, it's because of his blood, it's because of what he's done. That's what makes you pure and spotless, not you somehow getting your act together. It's what he's done and what he's doing in you. Amen? Yeah, all right. How about, how about keep me here until we're one? We sang that too. Keep me here with you in your presence until we're one. So that means I don't want to leave until I'm like you. I'm not getting up until you bless me, until you touch me. Until I want to be like you. Jesus walked in that kind of intimacy, so he, was, he had a confidence that got him crucified. And I'm telling you that he wants to walk, us to walk in such confidence that we're dangerous like that to the, to the religious world, to you know, the, the lost world you're not dangerous to. You're their salvation. You're carrying it inside of you, Jesus Christ and his spirit. All right, But Jesus understood who he was so much when they asked him who he was. He said crazy, crazy things. Like he said, I am, before Abraham was, I am. That's going to get him in trouble. Because he's saying that him and the Father were one. Jesus prayed that we would be one like him and the Father were one. I have him in me. I'm not him, but I got him in me. You know? But he's so powerful in me. His spirit is more powerful than my flesh. you got to believe that. You're not some special case for the blood of Jesus. No, I'm like, no, man, his, 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 his spirit is more powerful than your flesh. So I can pray, and I, I pray the word of God. And he says that he's Christ in me, the hope of glory, that he's in me. He's in the Father. I'm in him, and he's in me. So that if he's in me, his spirit, then that means that I am peace. I am hope. I am joy. I am life. I am abundance. And when I come into the room, I bring it with me. Jesus knew that. And it got him crucified. <laughs> like, dangerous man. Dangerous. Come on. I'm carrying him. The fullness of him. And I know it. And when you start knowing it, it begins to manifest in your life. Who you are. What you have. To him who has, more is given. What you're sowing everywhere you go, what's coming out of you, becomes what you're harvesting every moment of your life. And if it's anxiety, fear, and this stuff, that's what you start getting the harvest of in your life. Because you're sowing that seed every day, everywhere you go, everything that comes out of your mouth. And that's why you got your harvest in that. Woo, come on. But when you're sowing the kingdom of heaven, righteousness, peace, and joy everywhere you go, you get a harvest of that. Come on, that's what we need. That is what we need. So when you're full of him, when you get shaken and squeezed, that's what's going to come out of you. Not all that other stuff. So fear's antichrist. That needs to go. Love is the opposite of that. That's Jesus. That's what we need. Yeah, and then we have, uh, over here we have pride, jealousy. That's the opposite of Jesus. That's got to go. Antichrist is what it is. Call it what it is. It doesn't belong in the church. It cannot be tolerated. And over here, you know, we have humility. Humility. Ooh, come on. When my brother has success, I have success because we're family. I remember one time there was this awesome conference like you guys are having, and it was happening in my neighboring city, and I was jealous as a pastor. I was like, I want that in my church. I don't have it. And I'm thinking in my mind, I didn't even know I was in this place, but he knew. And he spoke to me, and he was like, Brian, you're like David. And I'm thinking, oh, I love David. He's like my favorite guy in the Bible. And he's like, not the good part about David. You're the David that had everything and wanted Bathsheba. And I'm like, oh, gosh, you're right. <laughs> you know, I'm so sorry. Pride and jealousy, these things are opposite of humility, opposite of him. And, Lord, take it out of our church. Take it out of our church. That's what's good about family. And the government of God is family. And he's put us in a family. We're part of this family. Yeah? 
So when my brother Jason had success, man, I got success. I'm proud of him. That's my brother, you know, or Brian, or, uh, or you. And we can celebrate each other's success because I'm not an orphan anymore, and I know there's bread for me. You know, I got my own bread. Papa's got bread for me. There's enough. There's always enough. That's something Heidi always says, and I love it. But this, uh, the Lord gave me a word for this church I felt today when we were out here talking that the winter is over and springtime has come. The winter is over and springtime has come. Yes. Thank you, Lord. I was feeling even yesterday as I was thinking about this church down in Timberville. Uh, winter is over. The springtime has come. And, you know, we're, we're coming out of the wilderness, leaning on our beloved. And that's where we are right now. We're walking out of it into a new season. There's fresh oil for this house. Fresh oil for you, for this ministry, for this house, for this church family. Yeah, thank you, Father. For the leadership here, fresh oil and fresh anointings. Fresh anointings, uh, which we know I'll, I'll talk about when I minister later, but um, I want to talk about a good kind of jealousy in a minute about how he's jealous for us. I'm going to talk about that in a moment, but there's fresh anointings in the church that the church hasn't seen before. A lot of times, our nature is we see something good and we want to copy it. And that's human nature, and that makes sense, you know. You know, but, but God doesn't necessarily want you to copy something else that works, something that somebody else is doing. You know, uh, sure, I believe if you've got a charismatic personality and you follow certain steps, you can build a big church. You do certain things you know, uh, cater to the people, do what they, you know, they want. but it's not their church, it's his church. You know, what does he want? What does he want to do? What does he want you to do? And maybe there's fresh anointings the world has not seen. The keys to win this generation for Jesus Christ. And it, and it looks different than what has been done in the past. This is a broken generation. They're hurt, they're broken, Many of the fatherless, and they need don't have families, don't have anyone that, that cares for them, that loves them. Maybe there's some anointings that fit into that that will help us reach them. The Lord told me, you know, he told me uh, when you embrace people, it's going to be like I'm embracing people during ministry times. He's like, that's how I want you to minister to people. And I remember, especially down in Brazil, you know, where I preach a lot, they don't really do that a lot in some of the churches that I was in. And I'm like, in some other places like Russia where we would go, like they really don't do that a lot. You know, you don't see a bunch of Russian guys like hugging all the time. <laughs> you know, we're like, but the Lord says, well, you can do things the way everybody else does or you can do what I anointed you to do. And he says, if you do what I anointed you to do, people will be set free in your embrace. People will be set free. And I've seen that, you know, and it was modeled to me by Heidi where I saw her, uh, God use her in deliverance ministry. And I saw people getting set free just in hugs. That seemed crazy to me. Because I was taught the only way you talk to a demon is you yell at it. And you tell it to get out and you do it loud. But then the Lord said, you know, Brian, only one person wants a show. And that's the enemy. That's the devil. Because he's lost and he wants a show. He wants something long and dragged out so everybody can see it. But Jesus never did that in the Bible, not one time. He spoke. Authority, power. <laughs> he's the only only one that wants to show is the enemy. And he loves that because he knows he's defeated. He just wants a moment of fame. <laughs> but there's fresh anointings. Another one the Lord gave me, he said, sing in the spirit. And when you sing in the spirit, I'm going to set people free. Oh, that's strange, too. I don't see a lot of people doing that during the ministry time. Usually, you know, it's just, you know, they're pushing people down or whatever. But they're not like, you know, they're not like singing over people. I'm just joking. But you know people do that. It's like, <laughs> I used to be one of those guys where I was really stubborn. I'm like, I'm not going down. They're going to have to, they're going to have to like throw me down. But now I'm just like, so since it's, I'm like, I start on my knees because I'm going down even if the wind blows. <laughs> you know, we're like, and I don't want to hurt people because I'm big. <laughs> Whew. So be expecting fresh anointings. Whoa, whoa, what does God want to give you? Listen. Listen to him. What's he speak to you in the secret place? Ask him, Lord. 
what do you have for me? What are the keys and strategies you want to give me to help reach this generation, God? I want to be a guinea pig for the things of God. You want to do something new? Try it out on me. I'll take the new manifestation. I don't need to understand it. I just want what you have. I don't need to understand things. I don't know why people think they need to understand everything. I've got a master's degree in theology. I understand wanting to understand things. But, I, but I'm telling you, like, I don't need to understand. I'm a man of authority. Man of authority. He's a God of authority. And I knew when I was playing football, my coach down here at Bridgewater told me to do something. I didn't ask him why. I knew he wanted to win the football game. So all I needed was the instruction. And that's all I need now, and it's blessed my life. That I don't need to know why. When God says something, I don't say, why? Why? I just go and do it. Like whatever it is, you know. Talk to this person. Why? Just do it. <laughs> the Lord says to me something like, just do it, knucklehead. I mean, how many times I got, that's how he talks to me. <laughs> it's a term of endearment. Yeah. But as I'm thinking, as I was thinking about, I've been spending a lot of time in prayer, like deep uh, contemplative prayer, just in the presence of God, no agenda. I'm just there in his presence listening in silence. Come on. I love loud worship. I know heaven's loud, but I know he, st- he speaks in that still, small voice too. And I love getting in that place and just shut my eyes and just looking for him, listening, wondering what he's going to show me, what he's going to say. And as I do that, he just begins to always speak to me about how much he loves us. We sing the worship song, like how he loves us. And I used to always get guilty singing that. I'm like, why are we singing about us? I want to sing about Jesus. And that's, you know, when you lift him up and adore him, the glory comes. He lives in our praises. That's just a fact. You want the, but if we tap into the prophetic ever, that's when songs like How He Loves Us comes. Because we hear what he's singing. Now it's not what we're singing anymore. It's what he's singing over us, what heaven's singing. And we get songs like, oh, how he loves us. He's jealous for me. Woo, come on. He's jealous for you. That means he wants to spend time with you. He doesn't want you distracted. Man, we're too easily distracted. I believe that. We're distracted by so, so easily distracted. The smallest thing, five minutes in traffic, you get distracted. You come out of a powerful revival meeting, you're five minutes in traffic, and you're I've seen Christians go, I mean, y'all know what I'm talking about. (laughs) But he's jealous for his people. So many times in in the word, God tells us he's jealous for us. I'll I'll share just a little bit of that with you. Exodus 34, 14. For you shall worship no other God. For the Lord whose name is jealous is a jealous God. He loves us so much. He wants us so much. That's his name, how he feels for us like that. That's who he is. That's that's part of his love for us. It's a jealous love. He's like, I want you. I don't want nothing else to have you. I don't want pornography to have you, addiction to have you. I don't want this to have you, that. He wants you, all of you. That's that's what he wants, all of you. Shakraba. We have the worship song, all of me wants all of you. That's got to be the cry of our heart. Deuteronomy 4.24, For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. And he has come to set the world on fire, Jesus said, with this consuming fire. And he wishes it was already burning. That means he wishes you were burning for him like he's burning for you. That's what he wants, that, you're, that, you're, that he's number one. And if you make him number one, you know, he, he, you can rest assured that you're his number one. You know. he, he does a better job taking care of me than I do taking care of me. I always say it's like a dance, you know. When you're dancing, you're not trying to get anywhere on the dance floor. You're looking at the one who's leading. And you're not. You trust him that he knows where he's going. Jesus knows how to lead this thing. He's the head. Jesus Christ is the one who's leading. And I'm not trying to get anywhere. I'm enjoying it. I'm focused on him, and I trust him. When I jump in the river, 
I trust him that he's going to not kiss, smash me into a rock when we go around the bend. Because I trust him. Hallelujah. Come on. Exodus 25, you shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord God, am a jealous God. Don't bow down to the other ones. Come on. No more, no other lovers. He's the one. I've chased after all kinds of other stuff in my life. And I'm telling you, when I, when I got a taste of him, it was over. Over. Ooh, I believe this generation's made to be addicted, wired to be addicted. But and when you get a taste of the Holy Spirit... They're, they're done. I've seen stadiums full of them in Brazil. The sin, th three days we had 150,000 people in three stadiums simultaneously, average age, 19 years old. Come on. Ah. Woo. This generation's made to be addicted. Not just there, here too. I believe the last 30, 40 years, like we've all been like that. We've been wired like that. When I was a little kid, I was a, it started early. I was addicted to collecting baseball cards. I'd spend all my money on baseball cards. I'm like 10 years old. If my dad gave me money, I'd go buy baseball cards because I loved them. And I just it was one thing to the other, like in my life. And then finally, I met Jesus. And then, well, now I'm addicted to Jesus. I don't know what you're addicted to, <laughs> Ooh, but I'm addicted to him. And I, I'm hopeless. That's the only kind of hopeless case there is in the world, somebody who's addicted to Jesus. Nothing else is hopeless. Nothing else in your life you might be struggling with is hopeless. I was in Iraq in July, and uh, I was with this missionary who works in the hospitals there. And it's the same city where they had this rocket hit there last night, Kabil. And uh, we were in this hospital, and there was a baby that was blue because there's no o the baby's not getting any oxygen. And the, the missionary I'm with, she walks over, and she starts yelling at the nurses. She's like, why does this baby not have oxygen? The baby's blue. The baby's purple. It obviously needs oxygen. And the nurse said, the doctor says it's a hopeless case. And the missionary just got filled with, like, righteous anger, you know. <laughs> and she's like, there's no hopeless case. Like, get this child oxygen right now. And that's the way it is for you and, and those that you love. There's no hopeless case with Jesus. Where Jesus is... Hope is always there. Hope is at the table if Jesus is at the table. Sure. Amen? I believe that. He's the God of hope. The Bible says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy in believing. Ooh, come on. That means when you believe that he can break through in that situation, you get filled with joy. May he fill you with all joy when you start believing that he can do it. Oh, I trust him with, with my daughter. I trust him with it. I know he's going to do it. Right? Or I trust him with this situation. That I trust him. I know he's going to do it. Because he's jealous for me and my family. Yes? Hallelujah. Sure. So take your thoughts captive and come away with him. I've been hearing that this week. Come away with him. Come away with him. Go deeper. It's time to to rise up, to, to look to where your help comes from in this hour. So many times when I'm praying for people and prophesying over people, I see Jesus lift their, put his hand under their chin and like lift their eyes up. And he's saying, lift up your eyes to where your help comes from. You know, look at me. I, like kindergarten teachers, they say, one, two, three, eyes on me. I think God's saying that in this hour. I know you see all this other stuff. But look at me. Hey, and remember what I've said in the book. Come on, remember. Like, I have won the victory. He's not worried. He's not uh, afraid of what's going on in the world. He's moving in all of it. People are like, where's God in this? What's going on in Ukraine? Right in the middle of it. I've heard the testimonies. I've heard testimonies of how people have heard the rocket fire. They see the rocket coming to them. Then they see a huge flash of light and nothing blows up. Like, I'm hearing the testimony. He's right in the middle of all of it comforting those who mourn through the body of Christ. That's where he is. He's right here. This is where he is in the middle of all of it. What am I going to do? You know? And I'm so glad my wife went and other people are going because that's where he is. He's in us, in the middle of it. Where's God in my community? 
He's probably in you. You know, like, if you've got the Holy Spirit, he's in you, and he's waiting to get going. He's ready to go. He's not standing over there at the door with his angels waiting for us to get worship perfect. Like, he's ready to go. If you believe, he's here. I've said this before here, I think, but I've, so much of revival is faith. Is when you get enough people in the room to believe he's really there and just respond like he's in the room. And don't stop. <laughs> don't stop believing. Quote, journey. <laughs> like, don't stop believing. Shabba. Thank you, Lord. Yeah, wow. And I pray that you would have the confidence of Jesus. And I want to tell you the I am's of Jesus. Just talk to you briefly about them. And then we're going to kind of minister out of that, see what the Lord will do. But this is how confident Jesus was about who, what he was carrying inside of him. You're a temple of the Holy Spirit, a temple of the Spirit of Jesus. Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. John 6, 35, whoever comes to me will not be hungry. Whoever believes in me will not be thirsty. Okay. You know, whoever, uh, Mother Teresa said, anyone who comes to you should leave feeling better than how they came. You know, so I had a teacher like this in seminary. I would just go sit, his name was Dr. Joseph Umidi at Regent University. And he was my counselor, academic counselor. And I would go and I would sit with him and five minutes with him and I felt like I could take on the world. Like there was something about him that, it's so encouraging and just fire me up. And that's the way it is when we go to Jesus. And that's the way it should be when people come to us. Because we carry the bread. You know, we're in the distribution uh, business now. Distributing the bread. And the good thing about that is we get to partake of it ourselves. That's my favorite part about this whole thing. When you're loving someone, you get to feel that yourself. You know, A key to healing ministry, when you pray for someone... Visualize them being healed and feel it coming through you. Feel them. See them jumping, doing things they couldn't do before. See it in your mind and begin to feel it in your body. And it begins to happen. You know, Because you, you're carrying the bread of life. And there's always food for those who are hungry. And if you come to him, you will never be hungry again. That means you have everything you need. When you're, thir when you're thirsty, when you're hungry and you come to him, he gives it to you, and you will. You always have what you need now. You're good. It breaks my heart when I see the church not getting the fact that they have everything they need so we can focus our eyes on the ones that don't. You know, we have it because of what he's done. We have access to the fullness of him. You know, we can come to him boldly before the throne of grace. We've got healing, hope, peace, joy, love. We've got that. It's all in here. Thank you, Lord. Yeah. Jesus, the bread of life, sustains us spiritually. Jesus said, I'm the light of the world, John 8, 12. He who follows me will not walk in darkness. There's darkness in the world, not in my house. You know, not where I sleep. And I've slept in some dark places in this world. You know, whether it's downtown Detroit, New York City, or, or Pakistan. <laughs> like, I don't care. Like, there's no there's no darkness. I mean, I've seen demonic spirits, and I just like, I don't got time for you. I'm going to sleep. I'm tired. It's not going to bother me. I'm, I am filled with light. I don't have to worry about it. But light is essential to life and growth. Without light, plants will not grow. There's no warmth, no food, no life. Without light, we would be in the dark, we would not be able to see, but I've seen the light. You know, I used to be in darkness, man, but now I'm in the light. And everywhere I go, there's light. And the light overpowers the darkness, dispels the darkness. I don't get into big fights with the darkness. I'm not interested in that. Some people live their whole life in, like, fights, and I'm like, I don't, I'm not going to get into fights with darkness. I'm going to release the light. When I first went to a Muslim nation, one of my spiritual fathers uh, he said, when you go there, don't preach against Muhammad. Preach the gospel. Preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm not coming against this or that. I'm telling the truth. You know? I'm just preaching the gospel. I remember going to these, like, uh, uh, crazy protests down in Richmond a couple years ago. And you know what? When I was out there, 
I didn't talk about this or what I thought about that. I just talked about Jesus. They gave me the microphone. <laughs> you know, we're like, release the light. If you're not there, who's going to do it? Thank you, Lord. He's the light of the world. He says we're the light of the world. You know, you're the fire of the world. That's the only kind of light they had in the Bible. Uh, and he wants you to set the world on fire, a flame for him. Jesus said, uh, I am the door, John 10, 7, 9. Most certainly, I tell you, I am the door. All who come to me, all who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep didn't listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and come out and find pasture. Jesus is the door. Narrow is the way that leads to life, right? Jesus is the door. And then you step into a big old kingdom. Big, beautiful kingdom now. That, that it's huge that we get to come in. But Jesus is the door. We focus on Jesus. That's what we focus on above all else. So uh, be wary of, of all this. There's a lot of truth out there that people say is the truth. But it doesn't have Jesus in the right place. It's not true. That's how you know. Jesus is the center. That's what we come together around. That's what we, we, we agree upon Jesus and the gospel. Then we can come together. He's the only way. I'm telling you, he's the only way. He is the door. And we know his purpose. Thank you, Jesus. And it's that door into the righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit that we feel. That's how we access it, is through Christ. But I hope you feel it. I hope it's just not all in your mind. True biblical Christianity is not all in your mind. It's just not. You've got to get out of your mind and into your heart. You've got to get into your heart. Jesus feels a lot. And when you're walking in intimacy with him, you're going to laugh a lot. You're going to cry a lot. You're going to feel a lot. You're going to feel what he's feeling in certain situations. If you want to, you can feel what he feels. If you want to, you can have his heartbeat. Sure. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will still live even if he dies. Amen. I'm not worried about what happens when you die. Matter of fact, if I die, I told my wife, you better be sure you're here for the Lord if you try to bring me back. Because I've talked to people that have, that have died and gone to heaven and come back, and none of them wanted to come back except for one. And because he was a little boy, and he was in my church in Williamsburg, and he drowned when he was a little boy. And he was at the bottom of the lake for I don't know how many minutes, 10 minutes or something like that. And when he was down there, the Lord came to him. And he said, do you want to come with me? And he said, no, my mom and dad, they need me on the farm. I want to go back to be with them. You know, so he came back. But he's the only one I've ever talked to that wanted to come back. Everybody else wanted to stay because it's amazing. It's beautiful. And he has something waiting for you when you're done here. If you're here right now, it's for, you know, I'm here now. It's for you. If you're here now, it's for others. It's for those around you. We're here for them, just like Paul said. You know, otherwise, I want to much rather be with him. You know, but I know if I'm here, there is a purpose and there is a reason. And that's the truth for you, too. If you're alive, if you're here today, like, there's a purpose for it. God has something for you. And I want to tell you, you can do just as much on your knees in your bedroom in the Holy Spirit, just as kingdom significant as Billy Graham can do on a platform. You know, it, it, the thing is what he wants you to do. That's what you need to be doing. So, oh, come on. And we all have a part to play. So we just need to find out what it is that he wants us to do. So I recommend... Just release what you have. If you got a prayer, release your prayer. You know, if you can walk somewhere and do something, do that. But just begin to release what you have with what you have. You know, find a way to do it. It, it. it might start small, but once it starts rolling out, it gets to be some Holy Spirit momentum. And it gets to be this big thing. And I'm telling you, only the Holy Spirit can, can help you navigate once you get going. You can do... You can sow little amount if you want. And I'm not just talking about money. I'm talking about it's a kingdom principle. A little bit of love, a little bit of peace, a little bit of you know, healing, whatever it is that you're given out there. Or you can really give it all away and trust him for more tomorrow.
Like, I believe in if you want to give people the cookies, then we want to give people the cookies, which is the gospel and salvation and everything that comes with it, then we want to put it on the bottom shelf. We don't make it difficult for them. We don't make it hard for them. We don't say, well, you've got to do this and do that and do that, and then maybe yes, because Jesus never did anything like that. Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. You know, like, today, yes, now, come to me. Follow me. You know, he's very quick. He's the resurrection and the life. You're always going to be because of what he did. He is power over life and death. He's the one who's in you. You know, when you, when you, when you pass off in this world, you're just graduating to heaven. You're just going to another place. This prophet that you guys probably know, Bob Jones, came to our church several years ago in, uh, before he died. And he told the story about how, you know, back in the 1970s or 80s, I guess, he, he died and went to heaven, one of the ones who went there. And the Lord asked him one thing, have you learned to love yet? Of all the things he could have asked him, that's what he asked Bob Jones. He didn't ask him about the miracles he'd seen or the prophetic words he'd given. He asked him, have you learned to love yet? It's the most important thing. I want to be an apostle of love. I want to be, because of, of Jesus Christ, I believe what we are. We're going we're gonna to love God extravagantly, love our neighbors extravagantly. We want to pour it all out, give it all away. I've heard people say, Oh, they won't respect it if we just give it away. They won't value it. What a bunch of crap. Ter stupid. No. Give it away. Jesus gave it away. Aren't you glad he didn't charge you for it? <laughs> give it away, and he'll give you more. He'll give you more. I trust him for more. Give it all away. A poured out life. Sure. And as quick as you pour it out, I promise you, he'll pour it back in. He'll pour it back into you. I've seen it in my life where I began to, um, God asked me if I would give my life for a generation in Brazil, uh, a, genera a generation that is pretty much without fathers. So uh, I became Papa Brian in Brazil especially, all through our Irish global family. We call the, I guess because of the African tradition, we call the older men papas and the mothers mamas because in the African tradition, they're all mamas and papas to the village, you know. It takes a village to raise the child type of thing. So I'm Papa Brian, and it's the best thing in my life, just to love, unconditionally love. You know, how do I do it? It's very simple. And you can do this too. This is how you just start loving people. Just start uh, making time for people, being available. Like you can send me a message anytime. Like I want to message you back. Like you know that. Like people who are in relationship uh, with us. It doesn't take much. People just want to know somebody's there. I've had uh, this daughter of mine in Mozambique. She's like, I'm like, well, what do you want me to do? She's like, just ask me how my life is every once in a while. I mean, <laughs> some people have nothing, you know, uh, or just give them a hug every time you see them. I like all their Instagram posts, every single one of them. I want them to see that I'm always there, always following them. You know, it, do it doesn't take much. You know, who come on. How can you pour your love out? This world is desperate for it. And if you love them, they will love you, and they will love what you love. They will. I, I, saw, I saw that in my life, you know. I had people who were kind to me, who loved me, and I was like, your God's my God, your people are my people. It was just like in the book, <laughs> you know. And so many people are like that today. And they will follow. If you will, I remember this line in Braveheart. Do you ever remember that movie? I love that movie. It's an old movie now, I guess. <laughs> Ooh, come on, but it's such, yeah. But but this, they came up to this Mel Gibson, who plays the part of William Wallace. He came up to this guy Robert the Bruce, who is the rightful ruler of Scotland, and he was like, "If you would lead, I will follow you. If you will just lead, I'll follow you. I'll, I will follow you. But if you don't lead, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna get it done. I mean, when I married my wife." She's a strong Russian woman. And she's like, she's like, hey, you know, if you if you lead, I'll follow you. But if not, I'm gonna get stuff done. You know, like we're not we're not gonna not, you know, I'm gonna take care of business. And I'm like, hey, no, 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 I'm ready to go. Let's go. <laughs> you know? But I think people are waiting for you to lead. I'm telling you, if you lead, they will follow you. They will follow you. 
begin to speak, begin to love. Lead with love. You know, we don't, even with evangelism things, you know, we don't just beat people up with the word. No, man, we lead with love. We come up, we, we let them know that we're a family and we love them, you know, and we care about what's going on in their life. And then I can plant the seed. And then it'll take root. It's not just, not just emotional or anything. You know, it's got something behind it. Love is the power of God. You can't separate the love of God from the power of God. I used to, as a young pastor, I would, I would cry out for more miracles and more souls, and that's good. But when God started speaking to me about love, I didn't have time. I'm like, love, that's not really my thing. I didn't know they were the same thing. Like, that's the source of all the miracles. Everyone Jesus did in the Bible, that is the source. That's where it came from. He was invested in every person he, he ministered to. That was a son. That was a daughter. That was someone who was family. Everything was made by him and for him, the Bible says. Amen. He's the good shepherd. Shabara. Yes. <laughs> He's a good shepherd. He cares all about the sheep. We, we care about him. He's number one, and he cares about us. If you will give him a place to live in this earth, he will give you a place for eternity. Seek him first. Everything else is added unto us. There's a pattern there. He gave his life to protect us, to save us. Psalm 23 speaks beautifully of how Jesus is our shepherd. He's our provider, comforter restorer and he's our guide he's all of that he's the way the truth and the life he's the way he's the truth he's the life not only that he's the destination eternal life the bible says is in christ that's where it is ah thank you lord i feel the presence thank you jesus He's the way, the truth, and the life. He's the way to God. He's the way to salvation. He's the way when we're lost. He's the way when we're afraid. He is the way. He's the answer. If you look at the world today, look at what's going on in the world. It's hopeless without Jesus. But with Jesus, nothing's hopeless. He is the way. He is the answer. Oh, you have the answer. You're carrying the answer to the problems of the United States of America, to the problems of Front Royal, the state of Virginia, you're carrying the answer. You've got to begin to release the answer. He's the truth. In a world where there's no longer an absolute truth, Jesus says, I am the truth. He's the truth. Yes, there is absolute truth. Truth is not relative. There's absolute truth. There is truth. And Jesus is the truth. And we need the spirit of truth in this hour to rise up in you. Shaba. There will be a voice for the spirit of truth. When we see things that aren't right, we have to speak. When we see the sick, we have to heal. When we see injustice, we have to speak. When we see the poor, we have to do something. So that's what the world needs. I love the, the story of the early church in the book of Acts and how they lived together in community, and took care of each other's needs. We have what they need. Jesus is the life. Well, first, go back to Jesus is the truth. You will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. So when you know him, you get free. You know him, you get free. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. You know, right now, there's freedom for God to do whatever he wants to do. We've got to have that. We were talking before the service today, Ian and I, and we were saying how there's got to be a place like this. There's got to be a place like this where God is free to do whatever he wants, where the Holy Spirit's free to move however he wants. If he wants to come upon you with joy, if he wants to come upon you and bring tears, if whatever God wants to do, if he wants to heal, like there's room for that. We're going to pray for the sick whenever we get together. We're going to give him an opportunity to move. Sometimes pastors come to me and say, how come God doesn't do these things you see on the mission field here in America? And I'm like, when do you make time for that in your service? You know, honestly, when's the last time y'all prayed for the sick, prayed for the dead? When's the last time you did, when's the last time you did any of this? 
you know, because I know people who are doing it in America. I know you guys do. I know the people who come to this place who, who live here. Jesus is the truth. And you will know him and he will make you free. Because I know him, I don't care about the stuff that kept me in bondage anymore. It doesn't hold me anymore. You know? Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the life. Faith and salvation in Jesus promises eternal life. When Jesus speaks, dead things come to life. When you speak, dead things come to life. And God's going to use you to speak life in relationships, the life of your friends, when they need life, when they need hope. And God's going to use you to be his mouthpiece. The Bible says, open your mouth and he will fill it. How many times I've been speaking to people and, and I hear words coming from me that I know did not originate with me. It's, it's coming from his spirit in me. It's coming from the, the life inside of me. Jesus promises not just any life, but in John 10, 10, abundant life. I've come that they might have life. And if we're his disciples, that's why we're here. So I'm here today that you would have abundant life, that somehow your life's going to be better because I walked in the room today. It's the same with your family at home. When I come downstairs to be with my wife and daughter, I'm intentionally thinking, how can I make their life better? I'm a practical person. This is a practical application of John 10.10. We're his disciple. How can I make my wife's life better by me coming in the room? My daughter. How can I do it? Maybe it's by a word of encouragement, you know, a, a compliment. I don't know, a prophetic word disguised in conversation. I don't know. I try to get creative, you know. Like, I don't know, comforting my daughter after a tough day at school, you know, or... Uh, you know, it doesn't take much, but be led by the Holy Spirit and be intentional about it. How can you bring abundant life to Front Royal? How can you make their lives better? Oh, come on. Because you got, you have what they need. You have the answer. We give them food. We give them water. I love what you guys do here, but we got more than that. Yes, we got the Holy Spirit. We have life inside of us. And we, you know, when you speak, I pray that when you speak, that things come alive in people. I can tell in someone's eyes when I'm speaking and something jumps inside of me. You know, it's like uh, I was talking to Barb Shaw down at Timberville. Some of y'all know Barb. And Barb said, you know, the first time that she heard me speak at the place where y'all used to meet here, I think, because y'all met in another building before here, yeah? Uh, she said, when you were speaking, Ryan, something in me said, I wanted that. And I said, well, that's because that's who you are. Like, it's that spirit that recognizes the spirit, you know? The street used to say game recognizes game. <laughs> you know, like, you recognize. Like Mary, the, the, when she was carrying Jesus and she came to uh, Elizabeth, like the baby inside left. It's because it, it recognized the spirit. And when we come together, like, what I'm, when, I'm, when somebody's speaking that's carrying what, you, what you're made for in the spirit, it, it leaps inside of you. The early church, they used to say when they would greet each other, you know, the Christ in me greets the Christ in you. And, uh, oh, come on. It's something about when our spirits come together. There's a synergy there. God's mending the nets for the harvest in this hour. And I've seen it in the spirit. And it's a multidimensional net. So it's like when we come together, it's not just you and me come together. It's you and everybody who comes with you. And me and everybody who comes with me. And it's a multidimensional net. And when he throws this thing for the harvest... You're going to be surprised who gets caught up in it. I believe. I'm prophesying. You're going to be surprised who's in it. But he is the life. He, Jesus says, I'm the true vine. I'm the true vine. Every branch in me that doesn't bear fruit, he take, the Father takes it away. But every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it. So there'll be more fruit. So that means when you're fruitful, doing what God wants you to do, he prunes you, and he feels like he's taking stuff away. But really, he's making it so you can grow to what he wants you to be. When I was a student in seminary, I was the way I paid my way through school was I, I worked as the groundskeeper on the, for the student housing. So I would, uh, I would trim all the bushes, cut all the grass, weed eat everything. It was a crazy amount of grass cutting going on. And, and uh, I had to trim these crepe myrtle trees. 
And I didn't know how to do it. Nobody taught me how to do it. I was a young guy, and they gave me, like, these saws and stuff, and I just whacked those suckers off. Like, jing, 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 jing. And, the next, and then they grew back. The, my boss drove around on the little golf cart, and he was like, oh, my God, what have you done? And I'm like, what? I'm like, you told me they trimmed, and we trimmed all of them. Like, and I'm talking about hundreds of these trees all over the campus that we did. Me and this guy who was in the law school, none of, we didn't know what we were doing. And then, like, but then the guy, so he said, get in with me. He drove me to CBN, and he showed me their trees. And I saw how they trimmed them and how they grew as a result. And I saw the purpose of it all, like, to grow the way they're supposed to grow. And they grew up, like, vertical. And they were so beautiful. And we're meant to grow up, but there's got to be a proper pruning. And God does the pruning. When God does it, it's proper. It happens the right way. And pruning's good. It's not bad. Sometimes when pruning happens in your life, people say, what's wrong with you? Are you, like, in sin or something? Like, what's going on? What's going on in the church? Like, what, what has happened? We just had this powerful time, and now, like, these people left the church, and what's going on? <laughs> well, that's what's going on. And it's okay. When God does this, it's good. I remember one time we had, uh, we had someone leave the church. In my el- we were talking about it in our elders' meeting, and I remember I said, I think it's good. And the elder looked at me like I was crazy. He's like, what do you mean it's good? They left the church. I'm like, they didn't leave the church. They left our church. <laughs> like, and I think they're supposed to leave our church. I know that sounds crazy, but I thought it was right, you know? And it was a good thing. And, you know, the next week we came in and worshiped, and it was like a totally different place. And I'm like, just one person left the church that evidently was not supposed to be there. I don't know, but it opened everything up. I don't know why I'm saying that, but, like, <laughs> like, you know, but, like, but we felt the next week it was like glory, and I'm like, what? Like, it's open. Like, I don't know. They must have been praying against us the whole time. <laughs> Woo, Shabba. I don't know how I got talking about that. <laughs> Shoo. <laughs> Jesus is good. Yeah, whoa, we thank you, Jesus, that you are. Come on, God, you are the great I am, and that you are here today. So he is what you need. He is that. He is that. Whatever it is that you need, he is that. The answer is in him. He is healing. He is peace. He is rest. He is hope. Come on. (laughs) He is joy. She. He is everything we need. He is the God of revival, the God of breakthrough. He is the He is the reviver. I'm telling you, when you seek the reviver, you get revival. (laughs) And that's what we're going after. We're not seeking revival, we're seeking the reviver. And revival happens all around him. So, Father, we just thank you that for, for whoa, that you're here today. And I pray, Lord, that you just begin to move in the room right now. Holy, holy, holy. Thank you, Jesus. More, more, more. More love. More love. More love. More joy. More hope. More peace. Shoo. Anointing. Those fresh anointings I was talking about. Fresh anointing. Ha. Sha ba ba bye. My more, more. Shaba. Holy King. Ha <laughs> ha. Some of you, you're gonna, you're gonna be there's whoa, when you begin to sing in the Holy Spirit, it's gonna be power. Some of you is to dance. Some of you it's a, it's a voice and and the Lord's like removing the hand and the spirit that's been covering your mouth, and your voice is gonna be heard. You've got something to say, daughter. You've got something to say, son. The world needs to hear. Show. Come on. <laughs> that the preachers arise. Even in the room right now, the preachers arise. The teachers arise. I bless the fivefold gifts present in this room. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Ha, ha, ha. Come on. Hey. I say there's no limits over you. I declare there's no limits over your life, son. There's no limits over your life, daughter. Whoa. Ha <laughs> ha. And the Lord says, Whoa, I'm so thankful you didn't quit. He's thankful you didn't quit. He's thankful you didn't give up because he loves you. 
Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, maybe there's new tongues for you, a new prayer language for you that's going to unlock things in your life, and God's going to give it to you in Jesus' name. Ho, oh, freedom, freedom, freedom. Reigns in this place. Freedom from depression. Freedom from oppression. Shabbatara. Freedom from night panics and attacks. And there's, I speak peace over you that you can sleep. Ha ha. <laughs> Ask God. Ask God into your nighttime. He's the Lord of the night. Shakarabatunde esembama. And he will give you dreams and visions. Well, ask him for dreams and visions, and you will have dreams and visions. And some of you, you need to keep a notebook by your bed. You need to write down the things he's going to show you when you wait, whoa, in the middle of the night, early in the morning. But I break off, well, I break off any, any limitations that have been placed upon you by others, spoken over your life. Curses, I break them off. Hey, ha <laughs> ha. Ooh, and you will know an intimacy with God like you've never known before. Hey, you're going to walk with him and talk with him. And he's going to tell you that you belong to him. So, he's going to tell you the secrets of his heart for your life. So, the Lord's saying your destiny is in him. He defines you. I hear the Lord saying that I'm your story. I'm your story. Some of you, you made what happened to you in the past your story. That's not your story. That's not your story anymore. Don't identify with that. That's not your story. When did you identify with that and said, that's my story? That's never been his purpose, his plan for your life. That's not your story. Your story is his story of salvation and redemption and blessing and victory. Holy, holy, holy. Holy King, Holy Jesus. I just pray any other spirit that's not of God, that's not, whoa, the Holy Spirit has to go in Jesus' name. It has to go right now. It has to go. The fear, the jealousy, the anxiety, it's got to go. Hey, addiction, got to go. It's got to go, got to go. Thank you, Lord. Woo, hallelujah. Healing for you, healing for you in Jesus' name. I pray strengthen the marriages right now, the relationships right now. Restoration, restoration, restoration. Holy, holy, holy. That there be miracles, miracles of breakthrough right now in situations in your life. It's been a long time coming and the Lord is moving right now. I just felt like a big rock was getting pushed out of the way. A big rock was getting pushed out of the way, an obstacle being removed. Thank you, Father. Ha ha. Yeah. Somebody is worried about their job situation. I believe the Lord is saying, I have new provision for you. I have a new place for you. Trust me, trust me, trust me. Knock and the doors will be open unto you. Knock and the doors will be open unto you. Holy, holy, holy. Supernatural. Whoa. He's a God of the supernatural. You got to stop limiting him by your means. That's for missions, that's for ministry, that's for family, that's for your house you want to build, that's for everything. Whatever it is, you can't limit him by what you can do. You got to trust him for more and ask him. Show. If you're believing for something by faith, something you know is good for your life and for your family, just ask for that right now. In the spirit, you can do it out loud however you want to do it, but just ask for that right now. Sometimes God asks us, what do you want? The Bible says, well, you have not because you ask not. Sometimes we feel guilty to ask God for things even that we need. Don't feel guilty for that. You will always have what you need. You will always have what you need. He supplies what you need. But there's some things that he has told you to dream about and to dream for, and you need to ask him. You need to ask him for these things. <laughs> some of you, you're wondering what to do. Or God's put a dream in your heart, and the Lord's saying, you need to take that first step. And I'll meet you there. 
Well, how am I going to do it? Just begin to take a step. Take a small step every day towards that thing I've shown you, towards that dream I've shown you. But I'm telling you, there's no limits for you in Jesus. Oh, no limits for you. So I would say to you, what would you do for him? If you could do something for him, and you maybe you've made up in your mind there's something that's keeping you from doing that, but I believe it's not from God. Money is not an option for him. Don't. I'm telling you, what would you do for him if you could do anything for him? What do you want to do? What is your heart burning for? You can do it. I'm telling you, you can do it. Begin to take steps. Begin to move towards that. Even if it's reading a book or shooting an email to someone or knocking on the door, just begin to take steps. Say that you are going to do it. And he will meet you. He meets you at your yes. We're a people of the yes. He wants to take away the no. In the presence of God, Isaiah was in the presence of God in heaven. And he heard a conversation, and God said, whom shall I send? He wasn't even talking to Isaiah. But in the presence of God, there's only one answer. Yes, I will go. I will go. Yes, yes, yes. He just needs your yes. Phew. He's taken me around the world for 20 years, and I didn't have the money to go anywhere. (laughs) Ha, 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 ha. Come on. He'll do it for you that's what you want or maybe it's a business that you've got a dream or idea about take the first step take the first step holy 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 i see new uh new ministries birthing from this church this is a birthing house a birthing house a birthing house and there's something especially uh on in this region around the table around tables around tables and uh I've been feeling it for months about this region. There's something about tables in your house. And God's going to use your house. (laughs) He's going to use your house. Holy, holy, holy. I see so much of what this house is going to do in your homes. In your homes, in your houses. Oh, places of fire all around the area. I saw barrels of fire, like 55-gallon drums burning all around the area. And they're your homes. They're your homes. So I just bless that in Jesus' name. <laughs> Woo. You don't need. It doesn't need to be fancy. I hear the Lord saying, it doesn't need to be fancy for me. You don't need websites to work for me. You don't need business cards to work for me. <laughs> Woo, to work. I just need your yes. I need you to say yes and walk with me. You just have to walk with me. Can you walk with me? Can you just walk with him? <laughs> Woo. Thank you, Lord. Yeah, but I bless this ministry. I bless Love Revival. I bless the fruit of what's happening in the weeks and months to come. I thank you for this time of transition, God, where they're going to these new service times. And I pray that it's going to be a blessing. And Lord said, I'm going to build a family here, a family that's strong. I want to build a strong family. And the, and the city is going to see my family. They're going to see how you love each other, how you don't quit on each other, how you champion each other. How you value each other. Whoa. Holy. And I pray for a move of God that's centered around that, that's centered around that family, the love revival family. Show that this house will be filled with the manifest presence of God. <laughs> wow. Shaba. Lives will be changed walking in the door. Walking in the door. But I pray for the orphans, show, to become sons. Orphans to become daughters. They're coming home. They're coming home. They're coming home. I see more that are coming home. People that have walked by this door for years that are coming home. More, more, more. Holy, 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 holy. Show. And I just believe there's something in this in this house for, for intercession and decreeing things and them coming to pass. In the city, in the government, in the families, in, whoa, on the streets. In the schools, decreeing things, things in the in the prayer. Whoa, in, in times of burning prayer. I saw like furnace, burning prayer and worship. Yeah, but we just bless this house. We bless the, the leadership here. With all I have in this Holy Spirit, I bless each one of you. Uh, with all I have in the Holy Spirit. And I pray you'll see you'll see more. You'll go further. <laughs> I give you everything I have of Jesus. And if you would like prayer, I'm here to pray for you. 
God, I bless you with all I have in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. All right, guys. Hey. Yeah. <clears throat> Could get some prayer. Um, if uh, nobody is particularly scheduled for ministry team, but if you're on the ministry team and would like to jump in, feel free. And uh, other than that, you're dismissed. Have a week, and we'll see you soon.